after Jesus had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. A centurion there had a slave whom he valued highly, and who was ill and close to death. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, asking him to come and heal his slave. When they came to Jesus, they appealed to him earnestly, saying, He is worthy of having you do this for him, for he loves our people, and it is he who built our synagogue for us. And Jesus went with them. But when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him to say, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come, come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but only speak the word, and let my servant be healed. For I also am a man set under authority with the soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. Turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> there is a recipe for an old fashioned, plain, simple vanilla pound cake that is absolutely wonderful. It is wonderful in its simplicity. It is so simple that I'm going to share the ingredients with you right now. One pound of butter, one pound of sugar, one pound of eggs, one pound of flour, and one teaspoon of vanilla, and apply your basic cake making technique. That's it. It's so simple. It's wonderful. Now, don't you know that some people want to take this plain, old-fashioned pound cake and make it fancier? That is, they want to add chocolate chips in order to spice it up, and then they will call it a chocolate chip pound cake. But I don't want a chocolate chip pound cake. I want a plain, old-fashioned pound cake. Still others want to put frosting on the plain pound cake, and order to make it look more elegant, to cover up its basic simplicity. But I don't want a frosted pound cake. Still others want to put peanut butter into the pound cake and so that it will become a peanut butter pound cake. But I don't want a peanut butter pound cake either, just a plain, simple, old-fashioned pound cake. In the epistle lesson for today, we hear of a church which was changing the true, simple gospel, was perverting the gospel, was messing with the gospel. Paul wanted people to hear the genuine gospel. In a similar way, I like plain, old-fashioned pound cake. But folks are forever messing with the recipe for plain, old-fashioned pound cake and making it into something else. So also people are forever messing with the gospel and changing it into something else so that it looks better, tastes better, and it is more elegant. What is the gospel? 
The gospel is a summary word. It summarizes the whole Christian faith. What specifically is the gospel? That Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by the powers of God, and that someday you and I too shall be raised up to eternal life. That Jesus Christ died for all of your sins and mine, and paid the penalty for all of our sins, and that we are, therefore, called to live a life of forgiveness. That we are to love one another as Christ has loved us. The Jewish people created more than 600 rules and regulations that they were to live by in order to be a moral people. But Christ gave only one rule for life, love as Christ loves. That is the gospel, eternal life, forgiveness, a life of love. Three ingredients to the recipe, so simple, all freely given. Don't mess with the simple truth of the gospel. Paul, before he became the Apostle Paul, was known by the name of Saul. And he was a fanatical Jew who persecuted and killed the first Christians. He was a feared man by the followers, by the first followers of Jesus. On the road to the town of Damascus, Saul was struck by lightning and blinded. During that experience with the lightning bolt, God penetrated the rigid shell of Saul's life and he was transformed. Jesus got into his heart the gospel got into his heart. Eternal life, forgiveness, a life of love. And that needs to happen to us as well, whether slowly or quickly, a fast bolt or a slow shock. It is crucial that the gospel penetrates the shell of our lives and that we know the gospel. We need to know that our parents and grandparents live eternally with Jesus. We need to know that our sins are freely, fully forgiven. We need to know that we are called to live a life of love the way that Christ loved. One of the things that Paul did in his ministry after he was transformed was to go to Jerusalem to meet with Peter and the disciples. Peter and the first disciples were very Jewish. They were Jewish Christians, and they wanted other new Christians to be Jewish too. That is, they wanted people to believe in Christ, plus follow the Jewish rules, regulations, and rituals, especially the ritual of circumcision. Now, it is one thing for a baby to be circumcised, but quite another for an adult male Peter and the other disciples wanted new converts to Christ to go through circumcision, a very painful process, in order to be Christians. Needless to say, circumcision discouraged new converts. But Paul was adamant and shouted, No way! Christians do not need to be circumcised in order to become Christians. In other words, New Christians did not have to become Jewish in order to be Christian. Paul uncoupled Christianity from Judaism. Christianity was to become a new religion and not merely an extension of Judaism. That was the missionary genius of Paul. He uncoupled Christianity from the rules, regulations, and rituals of Judaism. Therefore, Spanish Christians could be Spanish. Gaelic Christians could be Gaelic. Roman Christians could be Roman. None of these new Christians needed to become Jewish in order to be Christian. But new Christians needed to hear and believe the gospel, that Jesus was raised from the dead by the powers of God, and so will we someday that all of our sins are freely forgiven through the death of Jesus on the cross, that we are called to live a life of love, loving as Christ loved. That was the core 
Those were the essentials. You didn't have to become Jewish to be Christian, but you needed to retain the gospel to be Christian. You couldn't mess with the gospel. You couldn't change those essentials. Do you know the gospel? Has Christ penetrated the shell and hardness of your life? Has Christ broken through so that you know, you really know, that Christ was raised, by the dead, raised from the dead by the powers of God? Do you know that you are fully and freely forgiven through Jesus Christ? Do you know that you are called to live, to love as Christ loves? Do you know the simplicities of the gospel? But the simple gospel is never enough. Christians, then and now, are forever trying to change the gospel, just like people are always trying to change the simple recipe for pound cake. Let me give you some examples. The following are examples where the simple gospel was not enough and Christians became wrapped up in the issue of their day. And slowly and surely, the issue of the day became a substitute for the gospel. For example, in 467 AD, there was an enormous conflict between two theologians, Arius and Athanasius. At the center of their debate was whether or not the Holy Spirit was truly and fully God. Talked about this a little bit last week. Athanasius won the battle and the Athanasian Creed was written to state the doctrinal truth about the Holy Spirit. The hot issue of the day became the energetic focus of the Christian movement. No longer was the gospel to know that Christ conquered death, that our sins were freely forgiven, that we were to live a life of love. No, that was the gospel plus the doctrinal truth of the Athanasian Creed. Now, there's nothing wrong with the Athanasian Creed. It was and is great. But soon it became the gospel. The Athanasian Creed was the hot issue of the day, and it became more important than the biblical gospel itself. The year was 1743. The burning issue was whether the earth was the center of the universe and whether or not the earth was flat. That was the hot issue in the 1750s during the time of Galileo. Gradually, a Christian was to believe the gospel, plus that the earth was flat and that the earth was the center of the universe. The hot issue of that day, the earth being flat and being the center of the universe, slowly became more important than the biblical gospel itself. One more. The year was about 1950, and the Western world became strongly anti-communist. It was the era of Eugene McCarthy and John Foster Dulles. The world knew the gospel of Christ, plus Christians were to be a democratic capitalist, and being a communist meant to be a materialistic atheist. In the 1950s, Christians knew and loved the gospel. Plus, the hot and burning issue of the day was to be anti-communist. And as always, the hot issue of the day slowly became the gospel. The biblical, simple gospel of eternal life, forgiveness, and love was transformed into a focus of being anti-communist. What about the hot burning issues of our day? How have those affected you in your proclamation of the gospel, in your receiving of the gospel? Looking back, I mean, how much do we care about the hot debates and arguments of Arius and Athanasius? Precisely. And what were they arguing about again? So it will be in, in the 
2060s or in the year 2100, 50 or 100 or so years from now, another set of hot burning issues of the day will be in play. It's not that burning issues of the day will ever go away. That's not the question. The question is whether or not we have allowed or we will allow them to be tacked on to the gospel, handed down to us by Paul in the pages of the New Testament. Have you allowed any of the burning issues of our day to, to become the gospel by which you judge the faith of those around you? And for that matter, have you turned a perverted gospel on yourself and judged yourself as not worthy of the love of Jesus? If that is the case, then you and I are not living by the pure gospel. So what is that pure gospel? What is the core of the gospel in the scriptures? It's quite simple. It is eternal life. Because God raised Jesus of Nazareth from the dead, conquering what would seem to be the end of existence. The gospel is living a life of forgiveness because Jesus died on the cross, paying the price and fully forgiving us of all of our sins. The gospel is living a life of love because Christ loved the world so much and so we are to love one another as Christ loved us. That, my friends, is the simple recipe of the gospel. It is my prayer that whether slowly or quickly, it may penetrate the hard shell of your life and mine and that we know the gospel. Memorial Day is upon us. What could be more American or what could be more Southern than a plain, simple, old-fashioned pound cake? Not with chocolate chips. Not with frosting on top. Not with peanut butter. Don't mess with the basic recipe. <laughs> 